So, you know, working off of that, I think I would like to ask what would be the best way, right, to get our ideas at the very least uh, to, to make them appealable, to make them appealing to people of our age or even much more young or anyone in general, right? How can we make liberty attractive? Yeah, I think I'll have a first stab at that. Um, I don't think with the present government, we've got much to do as individuals, to be honest. I think people will see the demise for themselves. Yeah. Um, South Africa is quite evidently on a precipice. Um, and I think a lot of people are starting to realize that. And I think that that's the good thing. Um, so we don't want to be these silly optimists who say mm -hmm. that, you know, we only are going to channel an idea when we need to channel it or when there are only good things that are happening in the country. I think we can also recognize uh, being realistic as we are that it's because things are dysfunctional that I think is starting to sow the seeds of liberty among the South African mm -hmm. populace. And I think um, it's because of this that I think we can take a great deal of pride um, or you know, pride in the midst of the storm that we're in, in recognizing that South Africans are starting to wake up to the, to the nonsense that they're being treated to and starting to realize that daddy's not looking after them, you know, and that the government <laughs> is not your cradle to grave provider to yeah. whom you should uh, seek solace every single time. And I think that that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that what that means is that individuals, uh, families, clans, communities and societies need to roll up their sleeves and, and secure their futures. I mean, it's, it, it's a hard message. Yeah. It is a maturing coming of age message. A, a Our one. societies have yeah. been quite clearly infantilized. Yeah. And to yeah. borrow from Russell and Bertie, they've been infantilized um, through cheap money, debt addiction and frivolous, uh, frivolous entertainment. Um, and I think we need to wake up to all of these pathologies of modernity and realize that actually it's the individual that's in charge. Um, and, you know, we can all start securing our futures. I think the best thing that we can say to people is, I think, as Jordan Peterson puts it well, clean your room yeah. or to take responsibility or to tend your own garden is another way of thinking about it. And to stop outsourcing important things or un important stuff to untrustworthy people. Because if you outsource that stuff too much, you wake up one day and you've got a whole chain of unaccountability ruling over you. Um, and, and I think that at least the good news here is that people are starting to see that the it, it, like you don't know who to believe when it comes to your health. COVID has shown us that. Um, you don't know who to believe when it comes to your money. Um, you know, the, the Federal Reserve System in the United States is, you know, it's, colla it's collapsing in front of everybody's eyes. And, you know, the, uh, the alternatives are starting to emerge as well. And I think that, that that's actually a good thing, because what it's saying to people is that if you don't trust anybody with your health, you need to take ownership. You need to take care of your health. You need to be the one that's responsible for your health. If it's your money, you've got alternatives. You've got Bitcoin if you want to do Bitcoin. I mean, nobody's going to bind you to a set of ideas. So I think a lot of what we're or what we have to do as individuals is significantly lessened by the reality, not only of our country, but of the world as well. And we just have to be there to reinforce these ideas, to say to people that actually alternatives do exist. Uh, and alternatives, of course, would include um, ascribing to such foundations as the Free Market Foundation, where you can find, obviously, some of these ideas. Yeah. I think we have a problem here. Yeah, everyone is agreeing with each other, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and that's an issue. Because <laughs> I do agree. Um, I would say you strengthen the community, which is a collective. Yeah. 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 Uh, you strengthen communities, particularly. It's like what Pile said, it's, it doesn't take much to uh, show a young South African the main issues uh, in the country. All they need, just need to do is just step outside their homes. They will see uh, potholes. They will see basic del service delivery not being met. They will see high crime levels, high murder rates, uh, women abusement within their homes. These are the issues they will see in their daily lives. How you empower them is that you say to them that there are tools in which you can, as well as your community members, build upon to strengthen yourself against a failing state or towards propelling yourself towards liberty, freedom. You can start by doing community watchdogs, which is taking prominence in um, township areas as well as in rural areas. You could, what I see in rural Eastern Cape, where farmers now banding together to fight against uh, st a stock theft, to report against crimes, because they see that the police are not there or come quite late to assist them. Uh, I believe it is through empowering community members that we can sort of uh, put a Trojan horse towards these ideas of individualism or classical liberal ideas because the opposite is clearly failing them. And we can see th what's happening in our streets. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, Please. may I just chip in there? Uh, for well, obviously, I do not want to encourage people or to dissuade people from going to vote next year. I think it's important that they yeah. do. Um, but I think, or I sense that one of the things that many South Africans, especially young people, um, recognize is that even though they can walk outside and see the problems for themselves, they can see the crime rates are shooting through the roof. They can see the poverty levels are shooting through the roof. They can see all of that. And I think the harder job for us to do is to convince people that voting and changing the political party is not the be all and end all. Because I have a sense here mm -hmm. that people are saying, okay, look, I understand and I can see that things are dysfunctional. Yes. So what then is the solution? To just change the authority that's overseeing all of this. And I don't think that that's quite the right solution. I think it's part of the solution, but I think the real empowerment of the individual is recognizing that you are your own savior and that it's not going to come from externally. You know, you need to do things yourself. Of course you need to vote, um, but you are going to create the kind of change that you need to see. And I have a sense that people are not so much against the existence of an authority, they're just in, or they just think that the right kind of authority yeah. needs to be in place. Yeah. And I think it's incumbent upon us to let people know through channels such as these that the only authority over them should be themselves, um, their families, and people that they have voluntarily given their uh, uh, decision-making rights to, and not uh, an, an authority that's imposed upon them um, by, by, by the Constitution or by the states. Yeah. Very, very nice thoughts. I have to largely agree to like the, the last point on voluntarism, you know, breaches into a nice philosophical debate about, you know, where do no, parents that was get just for you. <laughs> <laughs> where do parents get the authority yeah. over children because it is not voluntary. But yeah, yeah that, that that would be another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, supreme authority. Uh, also, very interesting. If logical I may interject on yeah, the yeah. on that parent issue, I think it's also important that we involve parents within the education system in the country. I think public education has greatly failed many South Africans, particularly youth, uh, to the point where we have such low pass rates, be it mathematics, science, or any other subject for that matter. And it has to do with the fact that the families are no longer involved within uh, the deciding of the, the child on which school they should go to because of limited funds, for example. Yeah. That, that's, that's, that's a great point. I know one of our writers, Cindy Levabaza, writes about voucherizing education. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think that as a policy proposal, since you know, I work for a think tank, that would be something that would be pretty interesting to consider with charter schools in the United States. Exactly. Right? The, the, the movement of charter schools yeah. and the power that they give, particularly to parents, in deciding where their children are educated. And also in eliminating, I think in South Africa, right? I just saw yesterday, uh, Banyaza de Sufi posted, uh, I think a circular about jobs that are available in like the Department of Education. I think there were like a majority of the jobs were administrative jobs, but they were in the Department of Basic Education. So that tells you at the very least about all the resources that could be going towards, you know, actually educating children yeah. being, you know, eaten up in the admin in administration. So I'll use, I do agree with that. Yeah, I'll use a I'll use an anecdotal ex experience if I may. So I did mention that I I, I went to Boxburg High, but the nearest school to me uh, uh, tertiary, sorry, higher education wise is Leondale High. Mm -hmm. uh, have you all seen that video where there's like 40 students uh, smoking Mary J? Mm. That is exactly this nearest school um, that was near my radius, my home in Katlehong. Yeah. But my mother had the fruition to see that this is a bad school and sent me to a really proper school in, in the, all the way in the in in Boxburg, which is I believe is like a more close to thirty per, a thirty minutes drive from where I was staying. And now this is the time where there was like feed, feeding zones. Um, so to get behind that, we actually used my mother's uh, friend's address in order for us to actually <laughs> get into the school. <laughs> so uh, uh, Boxburg, you're seeing this. I'm sorry, <laughs> but. I want every single household to have that opportunity in which my mother did. Bad principals should be fired. Teachers that are not teaching should be fired. Parents should have the say in which schools should they, should they send their kids. Um, and I think it's very important that we do emphasize that. Sorry to interject. Yeah, yeah no problem, no problem. <laughs> I guess, you know, that 
can can it count as your closing remarks? Can it count? Yeah. Before <laughs> open up, you know, for questions from the floor. But yeah, I'm, uh, on my closing remarks, really, I think you know my my fellow speakers have summed it up well. Particularly in that discussion of individualism, I always like being at the very least contrarian because I want us to have pretty strong arguments, and I think we have led at a pretty strong argument in favor of individualism. And I think you summed it up pretty well, Pila, in saying the most appealing fact about individualism is the ability to control your own destiny. Right, yeah. like there's the you. If we can be able to communicate that, that each and every single individual controls their own destiny, and you know, collectivism, the, the most horrible aspect of it is that it it invalidates the individual. It makes one feel like they are not in control because there are all these forces that are you know controlling you and determining your outcomes. So yeah, the the I think the the strongest message at the very least that I can end with is that each and every single one of us controls our own destiny. Yeah.